Though its cover is worn and its pages are torn, and the places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book, worn and old, that can shatter and scatter your fears. We come today again to our series in the book of Ecclesiastes, and trust that God will bless, minister to your heart. Our theme for this book and this series is from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly his words of, wrote, he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. And thank God for the great shepherd. He leads us, he guides us through no matter what toil, what circumstance, what trouble, what trial you have, and what mountaintop experience you may have, he gives us the words to lead and to guide us in life. The theme verse of the whole book is Ecclesiastes 1-2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And the word vanity is simply an emptiness or a... uh, a vapor, something that's there and then it's gone. And in this theme verse, we've shared with you that it's superlative form, such as in Scripture, the holy of holies. And vanity is used more than 30 times in this book. Then I've given you this statement for life, attempting to find satisfaction in created things rather than the creator, will reveal that everything in life is empty and fleeting. I don't care if it's a vehicle, if it's a boat, if it's astronomy, if it's your job, if it's your house, if it's your mate, if it's your child, if it's uh, any possession, your diamond ring, makes no difference. Anything that's made has been made by man or by the Creator. These things are out to grab you, pull you in, and you begin to worship the created thing rather than the Creator. Now, whose grand scheme is that? It's the devil. He's the great deceiver. So we come to our series progression, and it's our third sermon. We've covered Nothing Changes, Lessons for Life 101, and saw that in Chapter 1, The Cycle of Life, and honestly, there's nothing new under the sun, just like he says. And read Chapter 1. Go back, listen to that sermon. It's all just cyclical. Chapter, then we went to Lessons for Life 102. Last week and this week, we're covering the five things that Solomon the wisest, richest man in all the world. He sought these five things, and he comes up empty. And we find in this, these two sermons, this series, 102, everything is empty. It will not satisfy you, because you were not made to have the relationship with the created things. You were made to enjoy all this stuff, God's blessed us and given it to us, but you are made for something better. To have that relationship with him, your maker. So we come today then to life's Lessons for Life 102, Everything is Empty, Part 2. And our text is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 2, verse 17. We'll hop around, give you a lot of scripture today. I trust God will take and minister to you. The main idea of our text today is after concluding that life and its activities run in a cycle producing emptiness, Solomon explains how he sought after five things to find satisfaction. And from this sermon, there is repetition to everything in life. Nothing is new under the sun. You should learn from this wise old sage the things he shares, and what he experienced, because he's walked the path. And he found out and concluded they don't satisfy. 
everything is empty. So I challenge you today, Solomon's pursuits are relative, presently pursued in our culture. Without a doubt, it's very real, very relative. What he did thousands of years ago, roughly right after 1000 BC, mankind, humanity is still trying to do it and find their satisfaction. And you must learn, you chase after anything apart from God, you will arrive empty-handed. We'll read our text of scripture as we go through them in our outline. We have here the wisest man who had all the resources possible to try everything that we're discussing. And I challenge you, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, heed the word of God. Don't think that you're different from Solomon. You're not. And in fact, you're lesser because he was sitting on top of the world. You might sit on the top of Newtown, but there's a much bigger world than that. And everything you pursue, you'll find it's empty without the creator being in his rightful place. All is vanity. So last week we covered... These three uh, parts of our outline, five, the first three of the five things that Solomon pursued, and we went in depth in multiple passages of Scripture of his conclusion and what he pursued in these three things. Today we finish number four and number five. Number four, the pursuit of work results in emptiness. It's incredible to me how much we can complain about work and yet tie ourselves completely to work. Isn't it uh, uh, interesting that we live that way? And Solomon did that. Solomon began to labor to get the very best, to get his all, to get everything this world has to offer. And he worked hard at it. And he was accomplished at it quite accomplished more so than you or i ever will will obtain so let's read our text and i'll read them for you ecclesiastes 1 3 what does man gain by all the toil or all the work at which he toils under the sun it's a rhetorical question he doesn't and then chapter 2 verse 4 to 10 I made great works, Solomon says. I made great works. Listen to his accomplishments. It's phenomenal. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forests of growing trees. I bought male and female servants and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than anyone who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. From my heart found pleasure in all my toil. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. If you go to verse 3 and verse 19 in this chapter, he mentions he did this all in wisdom. And God had blessed him to be the wisest man that ever lived. So he's not doing this in folly or jest. He's doing it in wisdom, the wisdom that God had given him. Notice his accomplishments, houses, and it's plural. Vineyards, verse 4, most likely grape vineyards for, from his wine, which we talked about last week. And in that day, certainly olive groves. Verse 5, gardens. He had the finest of vegetables, herbs, and shrubs. Parks, that's walking paths, grass fields, the first central park. Verse 5, he had fruit trees, that is, he had his own orchard. I love in the fall walking through an apple orchard. Verse 6, irrigation pools. 
He designed them so that all his gardens and fruit trees and orchards would be watered. Verse 7, workers for all his lands and possessions. Verse 7, the greatest accumulation of cattle and sheep. Verse 8, volumes of silver and gold. Verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 8, entertainment singers and choirs. Verse 9, Solomon became the greatest of all known time. And in verse 10, anything his eyes desired, his, with a spoken word, carte blanche, complete freedom to have anything and everything at all. That's his accomplishments, stellar in his works. Notice his analysis, though. We could say his conclusion. Chapter 2, verse 11 then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. He goes on to give further analysis, verse 18 to 23 of chapter 2. Listen as I read God's word. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. <laughs> how many times have you heard at a funeral, how much did he leave? All of it, right? Verse 19, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, that is, who ends up with all my possessions. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled, used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. So verse 11, we see his labor was intensive, expended, and he concludes it was empty. Verse 18, all your goods and accomplishments will be left for another. This person may be wise or foolish, in verse 19, but he's going to enjoy what you labored for. Verse 20, 21, everything will be left for someone who didn't work for it. Verse 22 to 23, work, toil, labor brings a burden, it brings sorrow. And even verse 23, you may have experienced this, your job can bring loss of sleep. How relative is the Bible today? This is a man speaking back in 900 B.C. And he knows the problem of loss of sleep because of the job scene. Wow. So just like the first three items that we gave you last week, work is a good thing. It is what God commanded and said we should do in the gar from the Garden of Eden ever since then. But just like the first three things, if the pursuit is only for work and at work, to achieve, to advance, to accomplish, to gain possessions, or your position at the job, it will leave you empty. Please heed the advice of the old sage. You must work, but climbing the corporate ladder will not bring satisfaction. In this text, you find architecture, engineering, agriculture, landscaping, and previously he indulged in entertainment, fleshly sexual pleasure, education, and in verse 18 to 23, these verses that are before you, it's really the confession of a workaholic. That's what he's saying. 
I worked so hard. I toiled. Somebody else is going to get it. I lost sleep over it. I labored so hard. Yes, I enjoyed it. But it still is empty. So look at another conclusion of his. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6. Let's read this verse together. It's stunning. Let's read together. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Can you put a price tag on peace? Peace and quiet. And Solomon, this wise man, says you're better off having just a little bit with peace and quiet than having a lot that you're striving and working and laboring for because it ends up empty. Here's the thing concerning this number four work, his pursuit of work. Here it is. Are you building in this life the short few years God has given you. Maybe it's 70. Maybe it's 80. Maybe it's 100. Maybe it's 60. In those 70 years, are you building your kingdom with the little K? Or do you have God's kingdom with the capital K first in your life? Seek first the kingdom of God. His word is true. And when he is in his rightful place, you have all of this earth to enjoy. But when you replace his kingdom with your kingdom, let me tell you, you're going to come up empty-handed every time. God's word is true. His word stands forever. And these are the words of God. Friend, you can build your little kingdom and do pretty well at it. God's given you the abilities to work hard, to do well, to have success. But the lesson that Solomon is teaching, that your work, your accomplishments, your gain and achievement is all a gift from God. Enjoy them. Enjoy work. Do your best at it but never allow your kingdom to replace God's kingdom in life. The whole issue is assess what your pursuit is. Is your pursuit God or is it wine, enjoyment, sexual pleasure? Is it works? Is it all these things? that replace the created, the creator. Once you see number five, not only has Solomon pursued wisdom, wine, women, work, we see the last thing, his pursuit of wealth. Pursuit of wealth. I'm going to read you a lot of scripture just so you have an idea how rich this guy was. It's amazing. So let's read the scripture. I'll read it to you. Ecclesiastes 2.8. I also gathered for myself silver and gold, the treasure of kings and provinces. Verse 7 and 8 of chapter 4. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. His eyes are never satisfied with riches. Get that. His eyes are never satisfied with riches. There's everything's empty. So that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 to 15. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. There's a powerful verse. Take it to heart. When goods increase, 
they increase who eat them. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Everyone wants to come sit at your Thanksgiving table when you have plenty because you put the spread out. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hands. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. A couple thoughts here before we move on. And that is, uh, you come into this world naked, you're leaving this world naked. I can't tell you how many times by a deathbed I've sat with and prayed with someone who had no clothes on. It doesn't matter at that point of life. Death is imminent. It's there. And wisdom and wealth do not help you in that time. You're leaving it all. You're leaving it. And then notice uh, up in verse 12, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There's a grievous evil I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. Those riches were lost in a bad venture. And, and he just gives great description of money and wealth that will not bring satisfaction. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Solomon says, There is an evil that I've seen under the sun. It lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor. Notice where it came from. Your ability to have nice things on this earth is not a curse. It's a blessing. But it's a blessing from God. He allows you to have it. Verse 2 again. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity, it is a grievous evil. If a man's father a hun fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. And then I want to take you back to the book of Kings. This is where, when Solomon was living, he wrote Ecclesiastes at the end of his life. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. This is all that he had. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 660 talents of gold. Besides that which came from the explorers and the business of the merchants and from the kings of the west and from the governors of the land, King Solomon made 200 shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three minyas of gold went into each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with the finest gold. The throne had six steps, and the throne had a round top, and on each side of the seat were armrests, and two lions standing beside the armrests, while, ten, while twelve lions stood there, one on each end of a step of the six steps, the like of it never made in any kingdom. Here's his wisdom. He designs this stuff and has it implemented, and it's an amazing throne. Notice as we go on, all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. Get this, 
Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. For the king had a fleet of ships of Tarshish at, Tarshish at sea with the fleet of Hiram. Once every three years, the fleet of ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So he's filling his gardens and parks with these awesome, wonderful animals. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present, articles of silver and gold, garments, mirth, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. <laughs> I'll pick a stone up. It's like having a handful of silver in that day. And he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of the Shepheleth. And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Q. And the king's traders received them from Q at a price. A chariot could be imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so through the king's traders they were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So he set up just a trade station in his own kingdom. In the pursuit of wealth, of his wisdom, was an incredible, phenomenal thing. You will never exceed Solomon's wealth. And yet Solomon concludes this, and I want you to read these verses with me. With all that wealth and all his wisdom, here's what he says at the end of his life. Let's read together Ecclesiastes 5.15. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. And Ecclesiastes 5.10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth and his income, this also is vanity. And then you bring that over into the New Testament days, the new covenant that we live under. Read with me 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs. Listen, listen. If God blesses you with wealth, thank him for it. It's a wonderful thing. Praise God. Here's what God's word says. The love of money. And it's exactly what we're told you with Solomon. What's he in pursuit of? He was in pursuit of wine. He was in pursuit of wealth. He was in pursuit of wisdom. Rather than the pursuit of a relationship with the one who gives and provides everything that's where you have to guard your heart money wealth entertainment none of that's wrong he enjoyed it you can enjoy it it just can never replace your pursuit of god he must be first let's read hebrews 13 5 keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Please don't go out of here and say PTs against having money or making money. No way. It's the love of money that stifles and kills. The love of money. Can I say it this way? I don't think anyone in here owns a Lamborghini. Am I correct? 
if you do raise your hand. I want to ride. <laughs> Let's say you've worked hard and you go out and purchase this Lamborghini. And you add it to your collection of all these things. And God's blessed your life. So you just get your Lamborghini and you're enjoying it. And the very next week after you bought that car, the love of your life, whether it's your brother, whether it's your wife, whether it's your husband, whether it's your child, your mom, they die. Their life is taken from them. The love of your life. Let me ask you a question. In the moment you hear of their death, you are grief-stricken to the very core of your being. Do you really care at that time about that Lamborghini? Does that have any value at all to you? If you were in Las Vegas this evening and you felt like a burger, you could drop into the Burger Brass E or Erie. Brass, Burger Brass Erie is the name of the place. You can get a Kobe beef and Maine lobster burger with pancetta. Is that how you say it? Pancetta. Goat cheese and arugula drizzled with a 100-year-old balsamic. And that hamburger is going to cost you tonight $777 for a burger. You better enjoy it. <laughs> Or you can stroll down a little further to Mandalay Bay and at Fleur by Hubert Keller, you can have a burger made with Wagyu beef, Wagyu beef, and truffles. And the cost of that burger at that place in Mandalay Bay is $5,000. For a few moments, you may enjoy it, but it's going to go through the digestion system and to the place where everything else you put in your mouth goes. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust can corrupt. Listen, God's given you all things to enjoy. We shared that verse with you, Ecclesiastes 3. Next week, I'm preaching there. It, it's an incredible passage. Ecclesiastes 3, on time. But I say this to you. The things that Solomon was in pursuit of, wisdom, wine or entertainment, women, his fleshly passions, work, his job site, all the accomplishments that he, he did, wealth, having all this wealth and money, they all produce emptiness. Every single one of them, wisdom, wine, women, work, wealth, are good, in God's plan, are wholesome, in God's way, and they are given to you to enjoy, to have as part of this life, but never to the point where it replaces God himself. Solomon did every, outdid everyone in every area of life. He had the best and a multiplicity of houses. He lived beyond the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Anything and everything he saw or wanted was his. He developed sophisticated things. The pools of Solomon for irrigation can even today still be seen in Israel. They still exist and last. He had the greatest parties, the biggest feasts. He owned the greenest lawn and the most fantastic orchards and parks. He indulged in pleasures beyond imagination. He excelled in agriculture, engineering, construction, kingdom life, worldwide fame, wisdom, education. He had the best of entertainment. He even just bought his own band. 
in, in his own choir. He had the most awesome gardening and landscaping scenes. Solomon had it all. He was living the dream. And his confession is, it was empty. Empty. It doesn't satisfy. Everything is empty. Friend, you don't have to live or long for just a Chuck E. Cheese pizza. You can have the, the steak and lobster. Enjoy it. But what you have to remember is that nothing of this earth can replace your pursuit of God above all else. He must have first place. All these five things are part of the earth, and for you to enjoy, keep them in the proper perspective. Seek first the kingdom of God. Enjoy life. Enjoy everything this world has to offer. Don't abuse the gifts of God's creation. Do not worship the gift, worship the creator. Do not get caught up in a pursuit of the created. Pursue the Lord. Listen to Pastor Judd Wilhite. He's a pastor in Las Vegas. Here's what he says. The contrast of flying into Las Vegas on Friday afternoon and flying out on Sunday night is remarkable. He goes out and speaks a lot, and he's a pastor right there in Las Vegas. Here's what he says. Most flights coming in for the weekend bring a plane full of rowdy, excited people eager to blow off steam. The flights leaving Vegas on Sunday night are just as packed as the ones coming in, but they are as quiet as a cemetery. Living in one of the pleasure capitals of the world, I get a front row seat to many of the ways we try to fill our lives through entertainment. Vegas is wired up to a max out pleasures for any moment of time. The lights are on 24-7 with nonstop shows, gaming, shopping, food prepared by world-renowned chefs. People roll in ready to spend money, enjoy themselves in ways they would never do at home and are impossible to sustain. Live here a while and you learn this, that if someone stays long enough, plays long enough, parties long enough, they always bottom out. Many times they turn to God for help and walk into our church. 20 years as a believer has taught me that often what we're looking for in the pursuit of pleasure is really something only God can provide. And I end my quote, and it's so true. A man in India this year, it was reported by United Press International, K.A. strapped on his motorcycle helmet and roared off to St. Mary's High School in Candelin, where he works as a teacher. He arrived at the school, pulled his helmet off, and inside his helmet, he saw a venomous snake known as the common crat, K-R-A-I-T. It was coiled inside his helmet, and it rode with him for the seven-mile ride. K-A rushed to the local hospital where doctors determined he was not bitten, and nonetheless, K-A decided to destroy that helmet and replace it with a new one. And friend, that's exactly how the devil works in your life. He is the great deceiver. All these five things are good. They're enjoyable. They're part of God's plan for life. But Satan will dupe you into thinking, ah, just a little bit. He's the great deceiver. Just a little bit more. Just one more. And soon you're down a pathway that if you're honest, you'll set, look back and say, my goodness, how in the world did I get here? I'm that far from God. That's spiritual warfare. And you are in a battle. Your flesh is in a battle. And it may be about your fleshly desires. It may be about your job, your wealth, whatever it is. Satan's a great deceiver. And you must not build your kingdom with the little K, 
you must seek first God's kingdom with the big K. He made all this, these things for us to enjoy. It's all about the pursuit. What is it you are pursuing? Are you pursuing God or are you in pursuit of something that ends up taking you away from God? Listen, friend, love life, enjoy life, love Jesus more. That sums it up. Love life, enjoy life, love Jesus more. How's this apply to you? Number one, nothing of this world will bring enduring satisfaction. You were made for something better than the treadmill of life and its pursuits. It's the relationship with your creator. God desires that personal relationship with you every day of your life. Are your priorities in alignment? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word. Take your word, minister to those who are hearing it at this time, to those who will listen online. We pray that by your spirit, you will bring conviction, encouragement, that we might all seek first the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.